Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Praying according to the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8. Let's pick it up in verse 6. But now, say now. Now had he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Say a better covenant. Which, has, which was established upon better promises. It's a better covenant. It has better promises. It has a better priesthood. It has a better sacrifice. It's not the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats, but it is a sacrifice of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not a high priest ministry of Aaron, but it's the high priest ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not an old covenant written upon stones. It is a new covenant written in the hearts of men. And we've got great and precious promises. For if, verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. There was fault and shortcomings in the first covenant. So God has made a new covenant. And he's made a new covenant for a reason. He wants you and I to function in that new covenant. Verse 8, for finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, say the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, say the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord. For all shall know me. From the least to the greatest. For I will be, you see, when you get born again, the Bible says the very essence of eternal life. Jesus says this is eternal life that they might know me. The moment someone decides and makes a decision and say, I receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord. I believe he's been raised up from the dead. That moment they're transformed from darkness to light. That moment eternal life is lodged into their spirit. And the essence of that eternal life and the kingdom of God that is in there creates a knowing. And it doesn't matter whether you're a brand new believer. The Bible says you've received an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. There is a knowing that takes place in your heart the moment you are born again. So the scripture says in this new covenant, they all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he said a new covenant, he had made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. God wants you and I to function and pray according to the new covenant. It says in Mark chapter 2 verse 22, No one puts new wine into, an old, into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is going to be lost, and the bottles destroyed. But new wine is to be put in new wine skin. You've been warm, born again so that you've got new wine skin, and you have the wine of the Holy Ghost and the presence of God on the inside of you. John chapter 4 verse 23 and 24 basically says, Jesus said in John chapter 4 verse 23, he says, the hour cometh and now is, say now. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. 
For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Them that will worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Prayer is part of our worship. Prayer is part of our sacrifice. Prayer is part of our ministry to God. And it says here, they must worship him in spirit and in truth. So our prayer life must be in spirit and in truth. And the new covenant has made that possible. Because you see, Philippians 3 verse 3 says that you've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, that's Colossians. But Philippians 3 verse 3 says, you and I are of the circumcision which worship God in spirit and in truth. We worship God in spirit and in truth. You are born again, and the Bible says, if, if you are being born again of the Spirit of God, and if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Once you are born again, you are in the Spirit, you are not in the flesh. We might act like if we're in the flesh from time to time, but you are in the Spirit. So you have this capacity, by virtue of the new birth, to worship God, to pray, and to serve God in spirit and in truth. And I'm going to say this. You, are, you have the capacity to worship God and to pray in spirit and truth even if you are not caught, baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Now, you ought to be baptized in the Holy Ghost because this is a gift to all of his children. Hallelujah. But Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, You are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Does the spirit of God dwell in you? Does the Spirit of God dwell in every born-again child of God? Has not every born-again child of God been born again of the Word and of the Spirit? So if the Spirit of God dwells in you, right, then you are... But if the Spirit of God be in you, if the Spirit... Let me read it over. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. So God said he was seeking such a people. He was seeking a generation that will worship him in spirit and in truth. It says back in Exodus 19 verse 6, God said he was, he was going to raise up a kingdom of priests. Peter says that you and, I have, you and I are a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood, offering up sacrifices unto God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we are the people that God has raised up to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now I'm emphasizing this because we must awake. The Bible says we are to awake to righteousness and sin not. What does that mean? We are to awake to the reality of who we are in Christ, that oneness that we have, the reality of our sonship, and sin not. Stop coming short of the glory. In other words, stop living in some kind of place, in some place of separation from him. God wants you to be, to have a con, an awareness of being continually abiding and connected to him all the time. He that is joined to the Lord is what? One spirit. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse, verse 17. But now you see we live in a natural world. And because of this natural world we live in, it presses in on us. And we have this tendency to relate to, relate to God from the flesh. To relate to God from a human standpoint. But God is a spirit. You have been born again. He's the father of all spirits. And you are to relate to God, not from a human standpoint, but from the reality of who you are. From, from, you must relate to God after the spirit. You are God's offspring. Amen? You are to relate to God after the spirit. Let me emphasize that by saying this. How many of you have experienced the reality of tests and trials and flesh issues? <laughs> Amen. Has anybody been there? Amen. And sometimes that could so scream at you that, that you respond to that much more than you are to the truth of who you are. But God says, awake, 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 awake to the reality of who you are. Put on a new man and stop allowing that separation that will come from that carnal arena. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest. Remember, this is the better covenant. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities 
Oh, yes, he's touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Our high priest had to go through a lot of the flesh issues himself. He had to deal with it. But check this out. And, I, and because of that, we, you know, we read this scripture, we think, well, he's touched by the feelings of my infirmities. He knows what I'm going through and, and so on and so forth. That is true. But that scripture is not written there for that purpose. It says he too was tempted, tested in every point, like as we, deals with these weaknesses, has had to deal with these infirmities, but he's yet without sin. In spite of that, in spite of what he had to deal with, he never will allow it to create any kind of separation. He refused to deny the fact that he and the Father are one. And he refused to separate himself from his th in his thinking from the Father. So God wants you and I, no matter what weaknesses, no matter what feelings, no matter what tests and trials, no matter what infirmities, no matter what ignorances, no matter what it might be from a human feeling, natural realm that might come your way, no matter what, do not allow yourself to be separated from him. Amen. This is why he came. This is why he died. This is why he made you righteous. This is the reality of the new covenant. And to walk in the new covenant and pray in the new covenant, you must live in that reality in spirit and in truth. Amen? Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So this scripture is actually saying, even though you might have all these infirmities and these weaknesses and everything else, Jesus went through the same thing and he did not allow it to separate him. So what is he saying to you then? He's saying, put it aside. All of those infirmities, weaknesses, I don't want to call them excuses because I understand the experience of it is real. But he says, put it aside. Don't let it hinder you. But what should you do? Let us come boldly. Is that right? To what? To the throne of grace that you might obtain what? Mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So no matter what your struggles or your weaknesses might be, Lay it aside and come boldly. Why? Because you're a son of God. You're a child of God. And as Jesus is, so are you. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. And as Jesus is, so are you when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. When you're under pressure, when you're not under pressure. When you've been good, when you've been bad. As he is, so are you. Now, as he is, so are you in this world. In our walk, we got to recognize that as he is, so am I in this world. So I better be as he is. Amen? In the same way, we must recognize that I am in the spirit. That's where I am. So I better act like I'm in the spirit. Amen? Well, later on, we're going to find out that you, God has already brought you into rest. And you've got to act according to the fact that, that you cease from your own labor. Amen? Do you know you're redeemed from the curse? Do you know you're redeemed from every generational curse? But do you know that if you don't know that and act like if it's so, that generational curse could affect you? Are you redeemed from sickness and disease? But what do you have to do? You got to act on the truth. And I, this sickness has no authority over me. And you got to act accordingly. Amen? Whatever the truth is in the realm of the spirit, by faith you lay a hold of it. You fight a good fight of faith. What for? That you might lay a hold of eternal life. These things don't just happen. They are done. They are already done by the work of Christ. But you got to lay a hold of it by faith so that you can have the experience of it. That is why it is important to the preaching of the word so that faith might come. Hallelujah. So here you are. You are a child of God. And the Bible says that even though you have these issues, nevertheless, Paul says, I've come to the place. I've come to this understanding and this comprehension that when I'm weak, then I'm not strong. I will rather therefore glory in my weakness that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Paul says, I'm, 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 I recognize that, hey, I've got these shortcomings, but you know something? I'm not going to major on that. I'll lay that aside, and I put myself in this position, and I'm so trusting him that that is when the power, that's when the ability, that's when the grace manifests. As he is, so are we in this world. Now you see, we are first of we are we have access to the Father by one spirit. Ephesians 2 verse 18. And, and the very foundation of where this whole new covenant prayer starts from is our, our Father. Our this is Jesus speaking. 
He says, our because you and him are on the same plane. Jesus, the God, the Father is his Father, but he's also your Father. So Jesus says when you pray, this is how you do it. This is the manner in which you pray. He didn't say this is the prayer you pray. This is the teaching. Our Father. Jesus is your Lord. But the Bible says in Ephesians, in Hebrews 2 verse 11, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. God is the Lord God Almighty. Jehovah, creator of the heaven and the earth. But, the, but, the, but, but God, Jehovah, is your father. The creator is your father. Your Lord is your brother. So we come, our father. There is this, you and Jesus have been brought to the same plane, and you and God, and you've been brought into a place of, now watch this, equality with God. What do I mean by that? I mean you now in his realm, you are partaker of his nature. Jesus, it says in, in Philippians 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you. Let this mind, let it be. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That thought is not robbery to be equal with God. He wasn't robbing God of anything. This is how it was. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Amen? To be in that same plane, to have partake of that same life, to partake of his name. Well, so are we. So there is that sense of equality, he is God, he is almighty. We bow our knees to him, we are not God. But he has brought us up. You know, there's a species of animals, there's species, this species and that species, but he has brought us up. And he's made us his heirs, he's made us his sons and daughters. We are partakers of him. They wanted to throw Jesus off the cliff, why? Because Jesus said that he was the son of God. And they, and they had enough, they had, this is in John chapter 10. They had enough understanding that once Jesus said he was the son of God, they said, we're going we're gonna to throw you off the cliff and we want to kill you. Why? Not because of the works, but because you make yourself equal with God. Isn't that what they said? Right? Say, I'm God's son. Behold what manner of love that you might be called the son of God. So from a foundational standpoint, we must understand that in order to function in this new covenant, you are God's child, you are God's offspring, you are a spirit, God is a spirit, and you must worship him in spirit and in truth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Flip with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Now... Because of, because unfortunately, many in the body of Christ have been religiously thought, taught, as opposed to being taught by the Holy Ghost, and, a, and as opposed to scriptural accuracy. So there's a lot of religious ideas that have contaminated us and has created unbelief that causes us to function much more in the old covenant than we do in the new covenant. But thank God the word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 and 19 that you and I have been redeemed by the blood of Christ from every such vain tradition that came because of man and because of religion. Amen? But God wants us to walk in the truth. We are to live in, the, in, in this day of the new covenant. But you see we have to shed off the lies and the deception and the, the wrong ways of thinking and functioning that comes from the old covenant, that comes from the old man. So Jesus quite, oft, Jesus quite often said, and I do encourage you to go back and listen to last week, um, you know, where we talked about it a bit. But in John chapter 16, um, what, Jesus would use this phrase, in that day, in that day, in that day. In John chapter 16, verse 7, he had said, look, to his disciples, it's expedient, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, I'll send him. And when he has come, he will lead you. He will guide you into all truth. He'll take whatever belongs to me and he'll reveal it unto you. You know why? Because everything that belongs to me belongs to you. And everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me and it belongs to you. The Holy Spirit will lead you, guide you into all truth. And he's going to show you what's yours. Amen? And then it even, and it even go, and it goes on to say, um, it goes on to say in verse... Where is it? Verse 20. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that you're going you're to weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. 
and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. There is going to be this day, and the day he's talking about is the day after he has offered himself as a Lamb of God and as a sacrifice, after he's been, he's been crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended to the Father. He says, in that day, and after the Holy Ghost has come, he says, in that day, your sorrow shall be turned into joy. It's going to be turned into joy. And that joy, he says, no man is going to be able to take that joy away. Why? Because this, what will happen in that day is that you will literally move into a place where you are living in the presence of the Father. That's where you live. And the Bible says in Psalm 16 and verse 11, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. You're going to be living in that place. He says, in that day, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you that your joy might be full in verse 24. You're going to have the authority of the name of Jesus. And he says, that will create a joy. You're going to be living in this place where you're in fellowship with the Father. First Epistle of John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, John says, um, he says, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And he says, and he said, and he explained that, and he said, the reason I'm telling you this is so that your joy might be full. But we have all of these things that are a reality in this new covenant, so that our so that he can make us joyful, it says, in the house of prayer. Amen. Now, so what we need to understand in order to function in this place is. What is, what is different? What is different in this new covenant? What is different in this new day? Jesus uses the phrase, in that day, in that day, in that day. And all the time, like in John chapter 14, he says, the works that I do, shall you do also, and greater works than these. Why? Because I go on to the Father. Which means what? Because of my sacrifice. Amen? What is so uniquely different? About the day that we are living in. Think about it. The devil is cast down. Isn't that right? The wrath of God and the, 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 the price has been, the, the cost for your sins have been paid. Isn't that correct? We now have the Holy Ghost that has been poured out and is living on the inside of us. We have the name of Jesus. And we could go on and on. And what you will find as you begin to come up, we have a high priest that is seated at the right hand of the Father, but all of the things that you will find that are different about this new covenant will come right back to this. It will come right back to the sacrifice of Christ. It will, you will find that whatever it is, whether it is that now that you have the love of God shall be brought in your heart, which they didn't have in the old covenant, it's because of the sacrifice of Christ. Whether it is that you have peace that passes all understanding, whether it is that you are now made righteous, whatever it is, it's all because of the sacrifice of Christ and the Holy Spirit being here. Are you with me? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Now there is something very interesting about faith. Faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is based on what is already done. Amen? Amen? And, and, and it's, like, it's like I'm standing in faith concerning some matter, and I'm saying, this has already been done, and because it is done, I believe it is happening, and I believe it must come to pass, because he watches over his word to perform it. You understand that? It's because it's done. And because it's done, it's got to happen. And I am, I am, I am, I am bringing my believing, I am bringing my faith to come in agreement of what is already so. That's so very important. All right, Hebrews chapter 4. It was talking at the end of chapter 3 that the children of Israel could not enter in because of unbelief. And then it says, let us, verse, Hebrews 4, you need to see this verse, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, into that place where the work is finished and where it is done and where we don't have to labor, where we cease from our own labor. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Have you ever heard that scripture before? 
All right, let me read it again. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem, say seem, should seem to come short of it. The Amplified says that you should think he has come too late and has come short of reaching it. In other words, that there, is a, there is this where, whereby the rest is there. And quite frankly, you already have the rest. But if we don't have our understanding and our comprehension correct, then we seem to us, it seems as if we've come short. And, then, and many a times we'll function as if we come short. But you see, the rest is there because of the sacrifice. But, but, but what happens? We seem to come short of this rest, and we are in a place where we're struggling with guilt. We're struggling with shame. We're struggling with condemnation. We're struggling with, with some sense of unworthiness. Why? Because we don't understand the reality that we are made righteous, which is part of the provision. But it's part of what comes out of the sacrifice. We're struggling with self-effort. Maybe if I believe more, maybe if I do a little bit more of this, or whatever the case might be. We're struggling with performance. Why? And it's because somehow to us, we seem, it seems as if we've come short of this rest. And like as the children of Israel, we're not entering in because of the unbelief. The rest is there, but you got to enter in it. Are you with me? I mean, how many songs do we have written that talks about trying to get into the presence of God and asking Jesus to come? Why? Why do we sing such separation songs? Why? Because we seem, we, because we seem, it seems as if we've come short of the rest. Because we haven't yet awakened to the reality of the fact that he says he will never leave us, he'll never forsake us, he's on the inside of us. Continually. And therefore, we are speaking, singing, thinking, acting contrary to that. Which is contrary to heaven. The Bible says your conversation is to be in heaven if you want Jesus to rise up and subdue everything unto himself. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21. Let me ask you something. Are there things in your life that you'd like Jesus to rise up and smother it and subdue it and show himself strong? Well, it says, it says according to Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, your conversation, your speaking, your thinking, your attitudes have to be according to heaven, according to how it is in that realm where it is finished. Are you with me? Amen. All right. We can, you see, as I said, Jesus had to deal with some of the same struggles, but he, he, see, he didn't sin. What does that mean? He, this, in spite of the struggles, in spite of the weaknesses, in spite of infirmities, he laid that aside and he did not allow it to create any sense of separation within him, within his thinking. The fight of faith that we have is to stay in righteousness. Amen? 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6 and verse 12, verse 11 talks about the righteousness. And that's where the fight is really all about. Right? The Bible says they're, they're, if, jo if Joshua had given them rest, there, would, there wouldn't be this promise of this other day of rest. But there remains a rest for the children of God. There remains a rest for us. Amen? Hallelujah. So, all right. So, again, so what is different? I, I know you're hearing it. It is about this oneness. What is, what is, what is different? Here is what it is. It is about the sacrifice of Christ, and it is about the Holy Ghost. That's what difference. That's the difference. The difference is Jesus has gone to the cross. He has been crucified. He was buried. He was resurrected. And he's seated at the Father's right hand. He has shed his blood. He has given us his name. 